Let's see if we can just get those tyres screeching quickly. Listen to this. <laughs> see, that was 30 miles an hour and the tyres were screeching. If I did that in the Jag, I'd be in that field somewhere. Well, hello everyone and welcome back to the channel and more specifically, welcome back to this, which is my very red 2004 Mark One Audi TT, which I picked up on Copart for £475 plus fees. This was really a car that was essentially destined for scrap, but I accidentally came across it. I accidentally placed a bid on it. You all should know the story by now. And it's ended up in my possession. And the reason I'm making this video is because it's exactly a month ago to the day that this thing got dropped off on a lorry at my house. And unexpectedly, since then, I've been using this thing as my daily driver. So I've spent a whole month using this as pretty much my only car. And in that month, I've covered almost a thousand miles in this thing. So I thought given this milestone, I should make a little bit of a roundup video, a bit of an overview, an ownership review of this thing. What it's been like living with this 475 quid, for all intents and purposes, scrap car. And also how much it's cost me to keep it going and to get it to this point. So if you have been watching the videos on the channel with this car, you'll know that the first thing I did with it and to it once it was in my possession was to give it a jolly good clean. It definitely needed it. I don't really know the history with this car too much, but I think to the best of my knowledge, it had been sat for at least six months. And so it did need a good scrub up and it came out pretty well, despite the fact I had a bit of an incident with the machine polisher, which was not meant to be used on an impact driver which i've now learned from and i managed to damage the headlights uh, a little bit by burning them or scorching them i don't know exactly what you'd say despite that uh, it actually has come out pretty well and i've done almost a thousand miles in this thing and it's been at least four weeks since i did clean it and it does scrub up pretty nicely especially on a day like today in this beautiful buckinghamshire countryside i think the red paintwork does definitely help to well, make it look less dirty. I guess if you have a white car, if this was white or maybe even silver, it would show up the filth a lot more than this red. But needless to say, and my point is, I don't think this looks like a 475 quid car. Granted, that's not what I paid. I paid about 800, but over 100 quid of that was actually just the delivery, which is only to do with my location. But at a face value, it doesn't look like a car for the scrapyard, I think it looks every bit as good as it did when it came out of the factory. Okay, with a pinch of salt, but it looks great. When you do look more closely, you can see sort of issues with the paintwork. There's lots of lack of peel, like on the door handles and bits of it on the roof as well. But then you just remember, again, it is such a cheap car. And actually what we'll get onto in a minute, it's driving really well. And so, although the cosmetics are not great, of course, the wheels as well, are all pretty buggered it doesn't it doesn't bother me at all i mean i've never particularly been someone that cares so much about the cosmetics i'm much more interested in the drive and yes for the price i've paid as we'll get into in a moment it is driving absolutely fantastically now lots of that and i do want to give a quick mention to and honor the 1.8 liter engine that is under here because this definitely has a lot to say for how I've sort of fallen for this car. Now, I've been a guy, as you will know, if you've watched my channel for any period of time, that very much favours big cylinders. And, and, and that's, not, that's not changed at all. I'm much more of a high cylinder engine type of person. But this four pot, probably the fourth, first four pot I've ever really owned, is just spectacular. The way it delivers the power, although it's only got 180 of the powers, it feels like so much more. And actually, I haven't had this thing on a dyno, but that is something I'd be interested to do. I don't honestly think it's got more than 180. I don't think it's been remapped. I think it's just the way that the turbo kicks in. It, it, it just feels quicker than 180 horsepower, but I don't think it is. But that could be something interesting to do potentially to get it on the dyno, see how much power it's lost or if it has gained any that I didn't know about and then potentially get it remapped myself and see what that does. Because as far as I'm aware, these have got a bit of 
life in them. They can be squeezed and, and tuned uh, to, to extract a bit more performance. And it certainly, yeah, certainly doesn't feel like it's letting go at any point in this engine. It feels like a really solid sort of block. So maybe we'll investigate that in future content. But there is a reason I'm sort of holding off on anything cosmetic or performance based uh, for the moment, because next week, as I'm filming this, this car's MOT expires. Now that would have been one of the reasons that it was so cheap, but then again, it came with a month's MOT on it. And I think again, for the price I paid, that was a pretty good deal. I've had lots of use out of it, but the MOT is next week. And so before it's got through that or not got through that, I'm not really gonna spend any money on things like this or the cosmetics inside the car then and i do love how this thing has four seats now they are completely useless for transporting anyone above two feet in length but as you can see there you can dump stuff on there too we've also got these incredible nets at the side instead of door pockets but i mean there's a 500 milliliter bottle that fits in there no problem and then inside the center in front of the gear lever there's this little hatch i suppose you could call it where i've got well anything and everything in there this is my bluetooth fm transmitter now this costs less than 10 pounds and it allows me to use the radio and to play my own music off my phone so i use spotify on my phone i can plug that in there tune it to the same frequency and i can stream music from my phone through the oem radio player which is brilliant so that goes in this storage area nicely as does pretty much everything this thing goes really far and you can get pretty much anything and everything you want in there in there so that's really handy and i do just love i think i've said it before but i do just love the way this interior presents i love all of these sort of trim and, and fittings i love the matching rings that you see everywhere i love how that closes and just looks so minimalistic i love the really simple ac controls i even love things down to and i can't show you unless i can find the key i even love things down to the way the white lights light up i just i like the instrument cluster it's it's brilliant but as you can see if i was to start the engine now there is one issue which i'm worried about for the mot because in the uk an mot is a test that every car has to have once a year to be allowed to drive legally on the road and one of the things that's an instant fail on an MOT is any warning lights and we do have the sort of very common but dreaded airbag warning light on this TT there is a P there that's just because the handbrakes on currently but yeah the airbag light will fail this car on its MOT unless I can resolve it now I've done various bits of investigation and research on this airbag light and it seems to be a common thing with these TTs. Often the problem is one or two of the connectors under either the passenger side seat or the one I'm sitting on becomes loose or frayed or just a bit dodgy from essentially moving the seat forwards and back over time. And what that does is obviously throws up an airbag light when it doesn't like something. And the only way to reset it essentially is to use some specialist software. So I have done a few investigations. I've obviously read some codes, although I've ordered some other bits and bobs because I think they'll be able to clear it. I've also been looking under the seats. I've unplugged everything, disconnected the battery, tried to reset it that way, but to no avail. But I do know from the history of this car that it has had this issue fixed at least three or four times. So it is a recurring problem but at least it's not been anything that is actually a problem with the airbags. It's always just been something to do with the connectors under these seats. So hopefully when this new specialist code stuff uh, is coming, I think it's called VCBS or something. I've got that coming and hopefully uh, I'll be able to clear the airbag light before that. And obviously I'll check to make sure that it's still the same error code with just a voltage issue on one of the connectors but anyway that is the only thing really at the moment that i'm worried about it not passing the mot on because as i said it just drives really well there were some advisories on the last mot with suspension bits and bobs but i got no real causes of concern there because it drives perfectly 
The only minor issue is the tracking is slightly off, but I do plan on replacing some suspension components if the car gets through its MOT. And so I'll get it in for a four wheel alignment once I've done that anyway. But as a daily driver, this thing is just wonderful. That fuel tank, although small, I think it's only around 55 liters or so, it appears to just never go down. You fill it up, it's about 70 quid. And you can easily do, if you're careful, 450 or 500 miles to a tank. That's around 35, 36 miles per gallon, which is fantastic for something that offers so much performance. As mentioned, I've got my FM transmitter that goes in there. We also have this, it's from LA Carbon Fiber. It's just a mount that literally secures to the air vent and then your phone magnetically attaches to that, which just means it's not in the way of the windscreen at all, but in a really clear and secure spot. So in terms of, yeah, driving it around, I've got my sat nav, I've got my Bluetooth music. I've essentially got everything that I would have in one of those fancy press cars that I've been driving around in of late and so I just absolutely love this thing. It is just also really simple in here as well I mean you've just got the lights basically on and off you can turn up the brightness and change the position of the dipped beam I guess that is very simple there then on the side you've literally just got left and right for the wing mirrors which you can adjust electronically which is a real bonus and then hidden in here are the two really quirky electric window switch buttons and as mentioned i love these nets although they're a little bit well no there's nothing wrong with them really you can get pretty much anything you want in there there's a 500 milliliter bottle of water i can easily get that while i'm driving as well because this thing doesn't actually have cup holders so at least it has that and there's really not much else to it like i said the air conditioning controls are really straightforward and, and simple this is very straightforward mm. and simple to use as well I like how it tells you what you're listening to on the display in front of the driver too. Like I say, you can close that away. Heated seat buttons, traction control, heated rear windscreen, hazard light. That's that's all you've got. And it's very straightforward. And I just, I think simple. And it just reminds you that's how cars used to be, isn't it? Let's turn that back on, shall we? There we go. It's just how cars used to be. They used to be designed with driving in mind i think and not much else so it's just they just nailed it with this thing this is going to sound really nerdy but i absolutely love the filler cap and i love the feel and the sound it makes when you close it are you ready oh i also love the way the rear hatch or boot opens up like this and the fact that you can actually lower the rear seats if you can call them that and you essentially have then a van I mean, it's it's literally, it's a bread fan, isn't it? Huge, humongous hatch for loading stuff in and a pretty long sort of loading bay as well. That's probably a metre and a half or two metres, I'd say, up to the back seats. No, that's a bit optimistic. Metre and a half, let's stick with that. But it's just brilliant. Now, my only annoyance actually with this car and something I'd like to get sorted if I do end up keeping it is the central locking doesn't work. I actually have two of these keys. This is the worst of the two actually because it's got some tape around it but as you can see here lock unlock boot none of it works and it doesn't work on the either uh, the other key as well should i say which is a bit annoying um because obviously the only way you can unlock and lock it is like that but actually as far as i'm aware unless i'm missing something which i don't think i am i don't really ever use that boot because the only way you can actually open the boot is by going in here into our little secret hatch and pressing, uh, there it is, the boot release button. And then you can open it. But if you close it, there's nothing under here. I don't think, tell me if I'm mistaken. Yeah, there's no way I can get into it again unless I was able to click it with the key, which I can't because it doesn't work, or click the button in there. So that's that's a bit annoying. I'd like to get that sorted again if i keep this car but otherwise look at it i mean it's just it, it makes me happy and and not many cars do that you know you can have a really expensive flashy car and it makes you happy as well but that also comes with a, a share of anxiety i suppose because it's worth so much whereas because this thing is pretty much free i mean let's be honest it just makes you happy doesn't it look at it it's such a happy car. 
Oh yeah, let's drive it, shall we? Okay, so I've got the windows down in order so that I can hopefully give you a little bit of a, a glimpse as to why this thing is just so like fun and playful to drive. You can. I don't know how much of that you'll be getting, but there's this really fun turbo whistle as you get into that sort of band of boost. And it's just the most innocent but enjoyable thing. We're on a typical British B road here, very bumpy, very narrow. I'm not going above 40 miles per hour, but I'm really feeling like I'm driving so fast. I feel like Michael Schumacher, even though we're barely going above OAP speeds. And yeah, every time you just tease the throttle down around two and a half to three and a half thousand RPM, you get that little tickle of whistle. It's just the car's way of saying, tease me. And I think what I said outside the car is, it just feels like a happy car. Not only just to look at, but to drive as well. And when you throw it into a corner a bit too fast, you get that front wheel drive screeching as well. But that is the key with this thing is that you're never going, well, you're never going above the speed limit. You can be totally well within the realms of the law, driving perfectly reasonably, but you've just got the biggest grin on your face because it just has a way of rewarding you even at the slowest of speeds. I'm going to turn around and do that road again because that was a lot of fun. See, when you put your foot down like this and go all the way up to the red line, it's really nice and quick, but it's not as fun as just using the, the turbo in <laughs> the lower RPMs. Anyway, in terms of a daily drivable machine, well, as mentioned earlier outside the car, there's all of the quirks in terms of the storage. We've got the big boot, although it's not very useful for me because my key fob's not working. But it's a reasonably practical car. I've never found anything as of yet that it's too small for, unless all of a sudden my parents became senile and I had to drive them around everywhere, then I would definitely need something a bit bigger. But as I was just saying, I mean, because it's my daily driver, obviously I'm using it mostly for, you know, trips to the shops or short commutes to filming locations perhaps and you know often on these drives you're in traffic or the roads you're a little bit unfamiliar with but because this car is so fun at no speed at all it makes it a really great little daily driver because essentially every journey you do in it can be made fun and I have to say, this is probably the first time I've actually really sort of thrown it into a few corners and used the power. And it's great, actually. It's really fun. The brakes are fantastic too, but I think that's mainly down to the fact that this thing doesn't weigh much whatsoever. It's a really spot-on blend of practicality, running costs, affordability, and performance and, and fun. And so... As I said I would, I would talk about in this video, I slightly alluded to it earlier that, well, I haven't really spent anything on this thing because of that impending MOT. I do also have an intention to take this thing to the Nürburgring in Germany. I think it'd be a great little car for that track. But I want to spend some money on upgrading various bits and bobs before that trip. And I don't want to do that before the MOT, if that makes sense. But other than that, I've literally spent nothing on this car. That's the shocker. The only thing I've actually bought for this car are battery replacements for the key fobs, which obviously didn't do the trick. I've also ordered some extra 
software for, for reading codes on this thing and that was not much money at all but that doesn't really count and so I've literally had a month's motoring out of this thing for well whatever the fuel is that I've put in it it's it's just amazing now obviously I've had to tax and insure it so tax wise I think I'm paying for that monthly and it's no more than 30 pounds a month it's in one of the lower tax bands and insurance it was a little bit pricey actually it was about a thousand pounds for the year but again I'm paying for that monthly so that slightly inflates the overall cost but it, it was something like a thousand pounds for the year which is a little bit more than you might expect actually but uh, I didn't really play around with the quote too much I sort of just agreed and, and paid for it so yeah other than the tax the insurance and the fuel this thing is costing me nothing it's, it's, it's just brilliant and so now we're off the sort of fun B road and we're you know in, in a sequence of traffic and we're having to really pay attention as a commuting or a cruising car it's not bad it's not amazing and I mentioned in my sort of driving review video that the fact it doesn't have a sixth gear is a little bit bothersome especially on the motorways if I'm totally honest I wouldn't really want to do a really long road trip in this thing Obviously, if I go to Germany, I'll have to do lots of motorway and stuff there, and that's fine because I'm going to a, a destination. But I don't think I would choose, for example, to drive this thing up to Scotland because it is just so much the higher speed motorway stuff. And at 70 miles an hour, you're at around, I think it's around three, just over 3,000 RPM. It's a little bit noisy. It's a little bit frustrating. That's my only real complaint. But for the town stuff and the B road stuff, it's, it's, it's perfect, like I say, it's, a bit, it's, 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 it's quite a lot of fun when you get on it, but also just now cruising, I'm in fifth gear at 30 miles an hour and it's idling along at 1500 RPM. We're probably doing about 90 miles per gallon right now. It really does just sip fuel, which is a nice change for, for me, not really what I'm used to. It's also incredibly comfortable as well. I'm a big fan of these seats. They're very huggy and grippy. And they really mean you don't move around at all when you're pushing on a little bit but in terms of comfortability they're almost spot on I've not got any problems with these seats having done almost a thousand miles in this car I've not had any issues at all and I'm a bit of an old man with my back actually I do get out of quite a lot of cars and think oh for example my Jag the S-Type which is you know commonly seen as the old man's luxury vehicle I really don't get on with the seats in that S-Type so when I do long journeys in that thing I'm, I'm in bits afterwards but this tatty old seat is just absolutely fantastic. I like the way it's sort of leather on the side and, and fabric in the middle. But the only thing is it's quite sort of rubby and so when you get in and out of the car it sort of pulls your shorts down but I won't show you that <laughs> of course. But yeah it's really comfortable, it's really quiet apart from at the higher speeds. It's very economical. It has a degree of, of specialness about it as well because if I went and bought a Citroen Saxo for 475 quid, it, it might literally have been as reliable as this. It might have done all the same stuff as this, you know, ran and drive perfectly. Uh, but it, it certainly wouldn't feel special and it, it wouldn't be fun either. But the TT, the Mark One at least, is, is definitely becoming a bit of a classic now. And so they do get, you know, they do get looks. They don't look like many other things that people see on the road, I think. So people are drawn to them. The interior feels really well put together. And for all the things I've mentioned before, it, it's quirky and special and, and fun. The whole thing is just very fun. And you know, I'm glad I actually ended up with this car because it's certainly not one I ever would have uh, sought out to buy. And you know, opinions change, but I certainly never would have, you know, wanted one of these Mark One TTs. But now I, I, I don't think I could bear to live without one. So we'll have to see what happens with with this one and the MOT. But I've already been saying to people off camera that I think whether or not this car lasts or stays on the channel for very long or not at some point I'm definitely going to seek out a nicer more sorted maybe more powerful maybe the v6 
uh, Mark 1 TT because I've really I just really love this thing um, it's, it's just brilliant and and I'm saying that in, in one that is probably probably the cheapest one anywhere when I bought it let's see if we can just get those tyres screeching quickly listen to this <laughs> see that was 30 miles an hour and the tyres were screeching if I did that in the Jag I'd be in that field somewhere brilliant car but we'll see yeah we'll see what happens I'll make sure to keep you updated uh, with this thing I thought I'd just literally hop in today give you a bit of a rundown of, of everything again and, and update you on this car so I hope you found that enjoyable was that discovery just sent out a huge plume of something good old Land Rover ownership eh so on Land Rover of course I've had that Range Rover from the out for a little while and there's more content coming with that very soon there's more TT content coming very soon obviously I'll update you with what happened with the MOT I've also got some brakes that I need to fit to this thing which have been sent to me by a really lovely company and hopefully if we get through the MOT there'll be a lot more too I'm also off to Scotland again next week for another exciting project. It's something I've actually uh, done before or attempted before and I'm going to be doing it again in a very special Porsche. So do stay tuned for all of the upcoming content. Thanks so much for watching. Do let me know your thoughts on this TT but to be honest, no matter what you say, I really do like this thing. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you